very hi everyone right. so we are live my name is jesse and i am with exploring by the sea of your pants for those joining us for the first time we're all about bringing conservation adventure and science into classrooms around the world today we are joined by seven we were joined by just like a week and a bit ago on a different context we were uh doing our scicom story time series uh highlighting amazing cool stories in science but today we are going to dive in more on the work and life of our speakers. We are joined live in Pasadena, California by Bob Akfredozzi, and he is a full protection lead on the MISAR Joint Space Mission right now. So the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is the one of the most iconic research facilities in the world. It's where a lot of the coolest inventions and people are doing work to get us up into orbit and across the solar system. So Bob Ax joined us a variety of times over the last couple of years, and he has worked on Curiosity, Cassini, the Europa Clipper missions, and more. Um, uh, I, I'm as excited, I, I hope you guys are as excited as I am about this. It's always nice to have Bob back back. And so without further ado, and to avoid me fumbling any more words, I'll turn it over to him. Thank you so much for joining today and take us away. <laughs> hey guys, yeah, so I'm Bob back. I work at uh, NASA's Jet, Jet Propulsion Lab and that fall protection um, title, that is basically looking at how spacecraft can fail. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little about that. I, it's, it's, I, I've talked about this a little bit before um, but because we are just at the anniversary of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13, um, I thought I'd go into that example for you all today um, and just sort of look at how that problem occurred. So you, I'll still tell you a little about what I did, um, my career path, what I worked on, what I find interesting about this job. Um, but I also just kind of thought I'd give you guys some context with uh, Apollo 13 coming up here. Um, so I'm going to dive right into the charts here. Um, and let's just let's be very clear. My biggest credential, of course, is um, the fact that I was in a Sharknado movie. Um, so this is a, a scene from Sharknado 3 where I'm on top of a space shuttle. I've never been on top of an actual space shuttle in my entire life. Um, uh, you know, playing with uh, David Hasselhoff, getting the shuttle ready to, you know, save the world once again from the sharks. That's Ray J there. Um, and of course, I get to utter, I think, one of the greatest lines I've ever said uh, in my life, which... Uh, which is, why is this? Oh. The shuttle would never make it through that wall, not to mention the sharks. Um, this is a great moment in my life. So I just don't wanna say like a career in aerospace engineering can also lead to very weird uh, experiences like being in a movie with David Hasselhoff. Um, this is me as a kid. I, uh, I just, this is just show, I don't have a lot of pictures of me as a kid because I don't like being in pictures it turns out. Um, but one of the things that I loved uh, as a kid was Star Trek. And it's one of the reasons why I decided to go into aerospace engineering. And what I really loved about the vision of Star Trek, there were a couple of things that um, resonated. One, of course, I, you know, I saw a, a real group of different kind of like different looking people. Um, I resonated mostly with Spock as a kid, just kind of felt like a little bit of like the outsider. Um, growing up, I'm half Iranian, half, Amer uh, half American. So I always felt like some sort of a, a member of two worlds um, that wasn't entirely kind of blended. I think a lot of us probably see ourselves in that position in different ways. Um, but I really love the fact that Star Trek showed a very collaborative workspace, right, where everybody had to band together to solve these very challenging things. Um, and it was also for me very personal because my uh, my family, who uh, you know, or my, my dad's side of the family, who grew up in Iran, they had watched this as a kid in um, in Farsi, of course, in uh, uh, in Persian. And my aunt moved to the United States when uh, when I was a kid and was learning English. Uh, and one of the things that we could do was watch Star Trek together because she already knew the stories um, and had watched them in Persian as a kid growing up. Um, we could watch them again in English together. And so it was this family bonding experience. Uh, and so I really took that, uh, I think both the, the aspect of like the very personal nature of it, as well as just the, the I love the vision of the future that Star Trek wanted to, to create. Um, and I, you know, I saw a career path there was just essentially to to try to build that future, right? And one of the things we can do is explore the, the cosmos. And I get to do that today through robotic spacecraft. Um, I also have cosplayed now. So my, my just my, I don't wanna say that my costume game has also gone up quite a bit since my childhood um, from that very plasticky, uh, you know, Viking, Viking is that the right word, attire to uh, me uh, cosplaying Spock uh, here on the, the bridge of the Enterprise. Um, all right, so this is me at work. Uh, I am in our test bed. So this is uh, basically the hardware version of uh, the spacecraft that we will eventually send to Mars, um, distributed out on tables. Uh, and then the racks that you see behind me there are racks that are meant to simulate space. So um, you can kind of read some of the titles in the on the racks, but essentially there are racks that you know provide 
the same star views that our star uh, cameras will essentially see on the way from Earth to Mars. So we can make it you know, feel like the spacecraft is really traveling between Earth and Mars. Um, there are our instruments or uh, uh, sets of things in there that simulate temperatures that our spacecraft might see. Uh, we have to do that in order to fool our spacecraft into pretending that it's in space um, so that we can test it, you know, the way we intend to fly it. And um, we spent a lot of time here in this test bed, basically, after we've designed the spacecraft, proving that it works the way we want it to work. And in many cases, injecting errors into the system to show that uh, it works and tolerates the errors or solves the errors, right, by switching hardware or using a different measurement in order to achieve the same goal. And that's kind of what I do today in the design process, which is design a system that in the presence of errors will either continue to operate um, if needed, or in some areas designed to kind of stop operations and wait for the ground to, to take action and fix the problem. Um, obviously you can't do that all the time. Uh, sometimes there's a very critical activity where you really have to design autonomy in the system, right? So the spacecraft has to take care of itself. And uh, during the landing, um, which I'll, I'll show you guys in just a few minutes, uh, that's the time where the spacecraft, we cannot control the spacecraft uh, with the delay between Earth and Mars um, fast enough to, to do it. So it all has to be designed into the system. So here's the launch of Curiosity. If you're not getting audio, it's just counting down the numbers from 10 to one, there it is. Uh, <laughs> we launched on an Atlas V rocket uh, on in November 26, 2011. Um, this is out of Florida. I was un unable to watch this myself. I was in a control room also operating the spacecraft um, at JPL. So I'm hoping for this next launch to go out there myself. Um, I have a deep affinity for Mars robots. Um, so this is spirit or opportunity, depending on, on who you ask, um, which is the previous generation of Mars robots. This is our uh, sort of a, a setup that we had for um, right during the landing. So those first two ro uh, rovers. Um, where I'm in the sandbox, uh, probably breaking some JPL rules in order to be in the sandbox, but that's okay. Um, and then, so here's the landing. Oh, this is me. I'm sorry, this is me again. This is in control room. So this is uh, one of the late nights. Uh, this is kind of near uh, the landing. We're about a week out from landing here. And at that point, we had to be staffing the, thing, uh, the teams 24 hours a day. Um, that's my good friend, Jamie, behind me. Um, one of the things that you find when you work on these missions together is that you also bond and uh, form a lot of friendships and relationships uh, with people that um, just, you know, we've been working on these missions for years together. So we end up kind of uh, connecting as, as really good friends. Um, and so we're here in the control room, uh, just mostly keeping an eye on things for this part, at this point out about a week out before landing, the spacecraft is really just kind of flying on its way from Earth to Mars. Um, we're very close to Mars. You could see Mars very brightly now, of course, if you were the spacecraft. Um, and then, uh, uh, oh, I didn't send this video, did I? Maybe. Oh, this is it. All right. Sorry, this is the landing video. So this is what we call the seven minutes of terror. And I apologize if this slows down a little bit. Um, we are going from about 13,000 miles an hour. No, nope, looks like it's playing, but it's not. Um, we're going from about 13,000 miles an hour down to a gentle zero. Um, there is, of course, ways of going to a non-gentle zero miles an hour, uh, which is just crashing onto Mars. And what we're doing is we're using the atmosphere to our advantage, um, right? We're using a capsule design like Apollo did in missions before that. Um, and we're decelerating by just kind of pushing air out of the way and causing friction with the air. Um, that gets us down. I apologize for the technical issues here. Um, that gets us about 13,000 miles down to about 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, it's not as thick an atmosphere on Mars, of course, as Earth. About the same atmosphere as about 100,000 feet on Earth. And so then we need a parachute to slow us down a little bit more. Um, this is the largest supersonic, meaning faster than the speed of sound parachute that we've ever built. Um, and we slow down even more on that parachute, but Mars atmosphere, again, not thick enough to slow us down on just parachutes. And so the last thing that we have to do is fall out of the parachute and fire our rockets to land safely on the surface of Mars. And so that rocket system there that you see is kind of wrapped around the rover. So the rover sort of tucked in there. And as we get closer and closer to the surface, we're using a radar system to know where the surface is. Um, we'll start lowering the rover here. Pauses again. So we start lowering the rover here uh, on this tether. Uh, it's the sky current system. So kind of like if you see a helicopter carrying a heavy payload, it waits till the rover touches the ground, cuts away the tethers, and then flies away to crash somewhere else safely on Mars. And of course, yeah, there's a lot of excitement. 
um, yeah, for most people here, this was years of their lives uh, get to get to this point. So a lot of you know people who, who put a lot of effort and time and um, you know miss birthday parties, you name it, to make it into that that moment. Um, so very emotional for all of us. And I think you guys saw a talk from Farah the other day. Uh, we have another one of these rovers coming up in uh, launching this summer in July uh, and landing in February of next year. Very similar to Curiosity Design. So I'm a proud going to be a proud parent or maybe grandparent in this case, I guess. Um, of that mission, but uh, very exciting for us to, to always see that. So I hope you guys will watch that one. So that's me again. So I want to talk some of the failures. We obviously were pretty lucky. Uh, we had some issues on the way from Earth to Mars, um, but some of our predecessors, the Martian missions, um, and one of the reasons why that that moment might feel so emotional to us is because we know the, the history of Mars is fraught with a lot of missions that didn't make it um, to Mars for various reasons. Um, so this is uh, Mars Observer. In the late 1990s, uh, we launched this mission. Uh, this was a, a very clever idea uh, in this time to try to take an kind of existing Earth orbiting design and use it at Mars um, to sort of save costs, right? Rather than completely reinvent the spacecraft from Mars, um, that's what they decided to do. Now, what really, it, unfortunately, what really happens here is this mission, as it gets to Mars, it has to pressurize the propellant system, um, and that propellant system is designed to slow it down as it approaches Mars, right? Because if you're flying from Earth to Mars, you're actually, you're going a little too fast. And what you need to do is slow down enough to get caught by Mars gravity, right? So if you like, if you just come in full speed, you'll fly right past Mars, you'll, you'll move your trajectory, right? We call called a, you know, a slingshot, but you're not, you're not trying to get to a slingshot, you're trying to get to an orbit. And so what you gotta do is slow down enough so that as you fall towards Mars, you start falling around Mars, and then you get into this circular orbit and you can fix and shape the orbit later on for the ideal science orbit, but you need to get captured um, by Mars. And so they need a propellant, uh, a propulsion system to do that, right? To fire these engines to slow themselves down. And the way they did that was by pressurizing that system right before they got to Mars. Now the Earth mission, uh, the Earth orbiters that use this design, they were always pressurizing their system within a couple of days after launch. No one had waited the nine month cruise between Earth and Mars to pressurize the system. And unfortunately this design was a little tricky. And what they decided to do was in order to keep the design kind of simple, they would turn off various ob uh, items so that they could kind of control the conditions, right? So imagine like you have a, an experiment, right? And if you do too many things at once, you really can't understand which part of the experiments affected things. So you want to control the experiment by saying, I'm only going to change one variable at a time. And in this case, the one variable they wanted to change was, you know, pressurized repulsion system. And therefore they turned off all the other variables, including unfortunately the radio that was communicating to earth. And the idea was they would turn off the radio, they would pressurize the system, they turn back on the radio, start talking to earth and tell us how it went. Unfortunately, what happened was they turned off the radio, they turned on the pressurization of the system, and after that, we never heard from it again. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons people have gone into the design and tried to figure that out. But one of the things we've learned now is let's not ever design a system where we're not communicating during these what we call critical activities. So anytime you have to change the configuration of a spacecraft or do a major sort of you know, design thing, we're like, make sure you have established communications. In fact, for things like arriving at Mars, make sure you have redundant communications. Make sure that uh, you know rainy day in over the deep space network here in California doesn't take out the ability to hear from the spacecraft, so that we know that um, we exactly know what, what what's happening with the spacecraft. And in that case, if you lose the spacecraft, at least you can learn exactly what caused it, right? So this is a you know a great example for I think all of us, which is if you're going to make mistakes, and it's we're all going to make mistakes in life at least make sure you learn from the mistakes because otherwise you, you, know, you just wasted a really good opportunity um, and, and lost a lot of, of uh, hard work in the, in the process. Um, so this is another very famous one, the Mars Climate Orbiter. This is probably the most uh, famous failure because it's also one of the more embarrassing ones, I think, from most people's perspective. Um, and this is the one where we messed up the units between the Imperial units, uh, right, which is like pounds and uh, feet and things like that, to metric units, right, centimeters, kilograms, uh, and so forth, um, newtons in this case. And, and what happened here was engines are often specified in imperial units, meaning they use uh, pounds of force, um, and controls are often Im uh, implemented in newtons, right, which are the metric units. Um, there was a conversion error in the software. And what's really interesting about this is that problem exists, and of course, that it's an issue. However, what's really unfortunate is there's a couple of things that really cause it to be a much bigger problem than needed. One of them is if you look at the spacecraft, you see this sort of asymmetric design. So you see a solar panel on one side and the bus of the spacecraft on the other side. And that means that solar panel is always acting as sort of a sail. 
because there is pressure coming from the sun. So it's actually slowly rotating. If you imagine my hand and this is the solar panel, this is the spacecraft bus, the sun is always pushing a little harder on this side than on this side. So I'm doing this little tilt, right? You can see my, my, my hand is moving out of the plane. Um, and that means I have to fire thrusters in order to do from, go from here back to here. So, right, if you're the sun looking at the camera, I have to like do this and fire the thrusters to slowly bring this around. But every time I fire the thrusters, I'm actually moving the spacecraft. I'm like, I'm doing this and I'm like, whoop, back in space. So I'm accelerating the spacecraft ever so slightly. And because of that calculation error, the, the metric imperial calculation error, we actually were in, in space in a different position than where we thought we were and going a different speed, right? We were going a different speed and a different place in space than we thought we were. And if you caught my talk last week, it's very key when you're talking about getting to, to places that you arrive both at the right place and at the right time when that place is gonna be there. So when you wanna arrive at Mars at the same time that Mars is gonna be there, we actually were still very close on this one. So we were at Mars. Now the problem is we don't know what ultimately ended up happening here. But we believe we either skipped off the atmosphere, so bounced off the atmosphere as we were flying past, or we missed it right by, by a long shot. Um, so we, we lost the, the mission here again. And then that same year, we also had Mars Polar Lander. Um, this system was a landed system uh, to, to get to the very surface of, of Mars. Um, what happened here was a, a, a slightly different uh, failure, which is that they were using these little sensors to figure out when the feet had touched the surface of Mars. Um, what was they were landing, they deployed those legs using pyrotechnics. So they fire these little explosive bolts, let the legs come out. Uh, we think what happened there was that as the legs came out, they tripped the same sensor that looks like it's touching the ground. They cut them the engines because they were like, well, you're on the ground, cut the engines off. And then we just fell the last couple hundred meters uh, uh, to the surface. Uh, now we're not exactly sure there, but that's the most likely cause of that given the timing of the activities. And so, um, and there's, you know, pleasant, plenty, plenty of examples. I'm gonna to talk to the Ariane 5 ones uh, where testing could have caught this. So this is Ariane 5's very first launch. Uh, this is a rocket that's still in use today. They've, they've been actually very successful since this launch. Um, but what you're gonna see here is as a few seconds into this launch, about 30 seconds into the launch here, um, it starts out very well. And then a little bit in, it's gonna start turning off to the side and then they're gonna to have to explode the rocket because it's going off course. And this is happening because they actually, in this case, they did a lot of really smart things. They reused hardware that they had flown before. So it was proven hardware and they knew that like it worked. Um, the problem that they did was they didn't really think through the whole reuse of hardware, here it goes. And those explosions are intentional, right? Because we don't want the rocket veering off course and somehow smashing into some you know, place where people live or anything else like that. So they, they blow it up so it's the smallest parts possible. Now they use a reuse apart, but they didn't understand that and the reuse, the environments had changed and they had changed some of the parameters and it saw new things that it hadn't seen before. Um, and therefore, as a result, it gave bad signal to another controller, um, which made it try to tilt the engines off. And then of course it was going off course. And you're actually gonna see this in the Apollo missions as well. So I'm gonna talk to that a little bit, and see if this works. So this is the Apollo um, 13 launch. So this is April 11th of uh, 1970. So we're just, like I said, a couple of days away from the 50th anniversary of this. I mean, the Saturn V is just a fun like rocket to launch. So uh, just beautiful rocket. Uh, now the launch of course was very successful and a couple of days in is where they had their first issue. Um, and this is uh, the aftermath of that first issue. This is a picture they took afterwards. They were uh, they did, did an activity where they were storing the the oxygen tanks, the cryogenic tanks here. Um, there was an explosion. They heard a bang basically, and all of a sudden, a lot of uh, telemetry, right? All these sensors that they had started showing a bunch of errors throughout the whole system. Voltages were dropping, um, fuel cells, these power supplies were going offline. Um, oxygen was depleting, so, and you can see the I'm, I'm pointing at the screen, but you can see this area here is where there would normally be a panel, and there's now instead a bunch of of ruptured space. Um, this is what the picture they took as they were separating. So this is almost as they were coming back to Earth uh, on the tail end of the mission where they could actually see the damage that was caused. Um, and here's a, it's a really strange and almost bizarre um, story about how they did this. Uh, and so like, let me just kind of walk you through this. This tank, um, this oxygen tank was actually first put onto Apollo 10 and uh, it was intended for use there, but they needed to take it off for some rework. And during that time that they did that, um, they actually caused just a small, uh, they had a small drop. It was like a couple of inches uh, from, from where it was mounted to the floor. 
and it caused a small amount of damage. Uh, main thing that, that they thought caused damage was a fuel, uh, the fuel, the fuel, sorry, the fill line in the, the tank. So they're looking at how much oxygen, such as the, uh, you know, cryogenics, the liquid oxygen that they're putting in there. Um, and so they, uh, they decide to go, they have to go rework this thing. And they've, they've actually been pretty smart about this again, right? So what they've done is they've taken the system um, that is designed to operate on 28 volts, which is what the spacecraft supplies. Uh, so the uh, spacecraft have a, a, a kind of a, a bus, similar to like 120 volts that your, your outlets provide here on Earth. But um, they use a DC on these spacecraft. So uh, it, it's actually more like your laptops or computers, right? They have that brick between the, the power line in there. And they create a, um, a direct current line. And they do that 28 volts there, but they also designed this tank to operate on higher voltages uh, here on the ground using ground um, support equipment. And what they can do, what they would do is they would fill this in order to, and once they had tested this and they fixed the, the issues that they thought they fixed the issues, they tested it by filling it with liquid oxygen again. And then they would wanna boil off the liquid oxygen um, as they to, to sort of to evacuate the tank and put it onto Apollo 13. Uh, and here's the, so the, the very interesting, right? Tricky part here is that, uh, as they were doing that, they, they connected to a ground supply uh, instead of the spacecraft. So it's a much higher voltage, 70 volts versus 28 volts or 65 volts versus 28 volts. And they, uh, they thought they had designed the system to work at 65 volts, but it turns out the internal thermostat there um, kind of in the middle was not really redesigned to work on the higher voltage. And they think that by leaving it on for so long, uh, they were about eight hours or so to boil off all this oxygen, they fused the thermostat. So that a thermostat, by the way, this is like a very similar to your of course, you know, modern um, air conditioning system or heating system in your house, it may, may use a slightly different system, but older thermostats are mechanical thermostats. So basically what happens is the material inside there changes its shape as a function of temperature, right? So it gets, like, let's say it just gets a little bigger as it gets warmer. And as it gets bigger, it disconnects, it moves the metal away from a circuit. And so the circuit opens. And if you design the materials and the distances exactly right, you can have this very simple mechanical design that as it reaches, let's say 80 degrees, in there, the circuit disconnects, and that way the heater turns off. And then when it cools back down, the circuit reconnects, turns the heater back on, and that way you keep it operating a very nice, comfortable temperature. Now they think what happened here is it probably fused, but no one knew, noticed that. And so the oxygen boiled away, they were, that was designed. They put this tank onto the, the um, uh, Apollo 13, and they ran this, this thing the whole time. And what probably, instead of reaching a comfortable, let's say 80 degrees, this thing probably reached hundreds of degrees, if not hotter. And so when they stirred it, it basically caused an explosion uh, in this tank and that ruptured the whole system. And so this is a case where they actually, like I said, they did a lot of things right. They, they, they had a system that worked. They thought they had redesigned it for the environment that it was gonna see. They tested it again after they had caused potential damage. And sure enough, you know, even in the case of Apollo 13, there was, uh, there was probably, I'm not gonna say there was no way to detect this because there certainly were ways, but in hindsight, it's much easier, of course, to say this is what they could have done differently. Uh, but it's an incredibly difficult problem uh, to kind of capture. And so, you know, one of the, the great things about the Apollo program and the, you know, the, the way they worked is that they really also designed and thought through how they could go through a number of different failures, even if without, you know, being able to potentially fix them, how do you deal, how do you manage a failure when you know that it's a, it's a high possibility? Um, and of course, some of the things they have to do in order to save this mission by using the lunar module as their lifeboat. So this was uh, on the command module. Um, they, they were able to use the lunar module to, to supply oxygen. Um, and right, they had to reinvent, this is the very famous scene, if you haven't seen the movie Apollo 13, the best time to watch it is right now. Um, they had to reinvent their air filter filtration system. So people on the ground took all the supplies that they had uh, in the spacecraft to build a square air filtration system that goes over a round hole and uh, you can see this is really just duct taped together and held on with a, a lot, you know, like a, a spring cord um, in order to keep this place, but to filter out the carbon dioxide that they were adding too much to the system and provide them with clean air. But it's an incredible story of ingenuity um, in the face of, of a failure that was almost impossible to, to really design away. Um, and so it's a, it's a wonderful story for this time. And so this is kind of what, you know, one of the things that inspires me to, to work in this is, you know, these are the kind of moments where as an engineer, um, you get to really feel like a hero, right? Like you really get to feel like you saved the day for a spacecraft. Um, and so it's really fun. There's a quote here, I, it's not gonna work that well. Um, so this is of course the Apollo 13 crew uh, safely on the Iwo Jima as they, after their landing. Um, it's like I said, you know, very few stories in this spectacularly and, and well, but a real testament to, to folks um, who, who made all this, you know, to, in, in the, the face of this adversity to save the day. 
Um, this is a quote from uh, Futurama, uh, which is, when you do things right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all, which is always the case for a lot of our really good engineering work. Um, you know, when you look at the, the landings for Curiosity and the upcoming uh, Perseverance mission, it's gonna look very smooth and graceful. We've made it look kind of easy because we've worked so hard behind the scenes to, to get to that point. And that is true for all of our failures, right? For all these missions, we always encounter something that the system had to fix on its own before we get to those moments. And, uh, you know, of course, we're very lucky that, um, that at NASA, people really do appreciate that the work is needed, um, right? That backup, that background work is all needed in order to get to the successful state. Um, but that's all, but that's not always the case, right? And you know, you can, you can certainly point to the world around us today and see a number of cases where, you know, we've said, oh, we don't need to do something because everything's going well. Um, but you really should be designing to, you know, these cases where a lot of things can go wrong. Um, and when you do, of course, the the results are wonderful. This is a, the engineering model Maggie here on Earth in, in Pasadena. Um, of course, during sort of cyber days when we were, we could all be at work, uh, but uh, right, that's that was the this is the the kind of the monument to all that hard work that people have put into to right to behind the scenes to make a rover on Mars uh, do incredible science. Um, I just put in some of my favorite scenes from from the rover. Uh, just again, like it looks so effortless now, but I know how much work uh, you know decades of work went into making this mission occur. This is a sunset on Mars, just a beautiful. Um, sunset over the horizon at Gale Crater. Uh, I will point out that sunsets on Mars are blue um, because the atmosphere scatters light differently. So the blue light scatters more forward towards your eyes as opposed to on Earth. Uh, and so therefore, you, as the sun is setting, you see a blue sunset instead of the, the typical orange sunsets. Um, this is a video from this past week on Mars. This is not high quality, but uh, you can see that is, uh, I'll replay it. That is Phobos transiting in front of the sun. So one of the Martian moons, it's actually, it's a, it's a, right, it's an eclipse on Mars. Uh, one of the cool things that you can see, and then really cool, the Phobos is so close to the um, to Mars that it actually orbits a couple times a day. So if you're sitting there on the surface of Mars, you're gonna watch Phobos go over a few times per day. And eventually uh, it'll actually fall, it'll break apart as it approaches Mars and become a ring of Mars, uh, which is kind of cool. This is a few, few thousand years away. So none of us, unfortunately, will get to see it, but uh, still kind of a neat thing. Uh, and then my, my personal favorite picture, of course, which is, uh, this is again, Gale Crater, the horizon that you see, and a tiny little speck being Earth on the, in the distance. Um, and if you zoom in super close, you can actually see the moon in there too. But um, as the reason, of course, why we do all this is it's at the end of the day, our, our goal is to better understand our own context, right? We want to go explore the cosmos so that we understand what it means to be human, what it means to share a planet together, um, and what, what a sort of an amazing um, experience it is that, I, that all of us can can be on our own little spaceship, this little speck on Earth um, together uh, and just understand what it means to be human and alive. Um, so it's a kind of, you know, a lot of our exploration at the end of the day is really about looking back on ourselves and um, understanding what it means for, for us. Um, so that's my, my quick, quick story, sort of how I got there. And, um, and of course, again, the hard work that goes in behind the scenes to make those kinds of missions successful. Well, thank you so, so much for an awesome presentation. Yeah. I love this one in particular, even among all your presentations, we started out with David Hasselhoff and Sharknado, and we ended up with this beautiful poetic sentiment, which I don't think yeah. has ever happened in a 30 minutes. <laughs> so thank you. Um, all right, uh, we got some engineering questions for you. Uh, Great. Explode rockets. So the rocket goes up, we understand why we want to explode it, but how do they do that? What, what do they... Is there explosives in the rocket? What do they press to make that happen? <laughs> That's a good question. I, yeah, there are explosives within the rocket um, to do that. I, there is a, there's essentially a pyrotechnic chain and I don't think they have to be particularly clever. They have a bunch of explosives essentially, right? Which is uh, there's oxygen and, and fuel on board. So all they need to do is, is to have that, all that basically explode at once. So they just need to rupture those, those systems. Um, so I, I don't know exact mechanisms, but I know that it's not like they, have to load it with dynamite. They essentially just need to explode the tanks uh, and let the two of them do all the hard work together. Yeah, that would be quite the picture though on social media. <laughs> with rocket with dynamite. Just lining it with, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like acne rocket. Um, you mentioned skipping off the atmosphere, that this is a potential. So for people who might not know at home, can you explain a little bit about what that means? Uh, yeah, so it's very similar to, I guess, like we're skipping a, a rock on a pond. Um, right, so if you're if you you know if you're trying to skip rocks on a pond, if you kind of come in at a very shallow angle, um, the the right the the that friction you'll right it'll as you come in, the the part that's going to push against you is the the atmosphere, 
So if you come in at a very steep angle, you're pushing straight into the atmosphere, right? You're moving it all aside. If you're coming in at a sort of a shallow angle, you're pushing uh, downwards, but there's not that much of you pushing down on it. It's mostly you're skimming it. And so the, it's an, the atmosphere is strong enough, right? In this case, in water, it's the surface tension is strong enough that it can provide enough force to just counteract your, your movement. And so instead of going in like this, you go in like this, but the atmosphere pushes you off and you end up going sort of straight along the, the surface of the atmosphere. Um, so you actually do have to come in at a pretty precise angle. If you come in too steep, of course, you're actually gonna burn up, right? You're going in too fast and you'll run out of, you'll run into too much atmosphere. So you, uh, most of these angles come in, like I think roughly around a 30 degree angle for the most part, which is a, the, you know, it's a nice long, slow movement through the atmosphere. Um, where you're you're slowing down enough, but not all at once. Um, and then uh, otherwise, again, and if you don't slow down enough, right, you essentially just kind of fly through the atmosphere over the top of the atmosphere and bounce off. But uh, yeah, the water water pond analogy is probably the easiest one for people if you ever try skipping a, a rock on a lake or things like that. Fantastic. I love, and this is something that we've highlighted in our NASA sessions the last two days, but I mean, the engineering precision to fire a rocket at Mars and have it you know, approach, come in at that exact angle at that point where Mars is met near, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I don't even know if there's an easy analogy for something that we could do here on Earth that would compare to something like that. It's, uh, yeah, there's not, there's not great. I mean, we have, I mean, first of all, let, let's be very clear, the, na the navigating between Earth and Mars and, and all the other missions that we do really is, to me, almost like a black magic because I can very much focus on one part of the spacecraft design, but I cannot fully fathom how they understand all the dynamics of oh, you know, there's gravitational influence from this and, you know, you have to account for all these different things. Um, and you're right, you have to arrive at a very specific, again, you have to arrive at specific times, places. Um, you can't be coming in too fast. Um, you're right, like you, all these constraints are adding up uh, pretty impressively. And so it seems like a, to my, my mind, like a problem that has too many uh, almost variables at once. Um, but right, you know, we talk about this and, and I, I believe if I, if I, I hope I get this number right, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm close is when we arrived at the top of the atmosphere on Mars, we were within a couple of meters. After traveling you know, the 500 million kilometers between Earth and Mars, we were within a couple of meters of where we wanted to be. I mean, that is well within, right? We, were, we had a, you know, a, a, an ellipse, you could be much farther off and still be successful. But you know, we were within the target, we were only a couple of meters off. And on the surface, with the dispersion of the atmosphere, we're only two kilometers off the center, dead center of where we wanted to be. Um, and that really is a testament, you know, it, one of the things is, of course, we're, we're able to control that, right? So we're, we're put on a pretty good trajectory immediately by the rockets and, of course, by Earth's and Mars movements. Uh, but we have very small thrusters that if you fire them right at the right time, and then you measure it using the deep space network, using multiple stations, um, you're able to exactly know where you are in space and how fast you're traveling in space. And so you can precisely model that and you can fire your rockets just a little bit to Re, you know, to kind of correct for any errors in that system. And so, you know, the, the analogy that I've seen before, which I think is pretty similar, you imagine you shoot an arrow at a bullseye, um, throughout our mission, we're really able to, you know, with the, with the rockets on board, with little thrusters on board, they're not big, but we're able to sort of tap on the arrow every so often. Um, it's of course easier at the very beginning when like, you know, a small tap will deviate the, the direction quite a bit more than at the very end where you only have a couple feet left to the, the bullseye. Um, but you know, you can kind of keep, if you keep doing that several times throughout the missions, you can keep that arrow really on a true path to the bullseye. And, um, you know, we've been, we're, we're getting better and better at that each time. It seems like as we, as we go through these missions. It's, it's unbelievable. It's marvelous. My, my face is <laughs> smiling whenever we have these conversations, but I, I love it. I, I love it too, just cause there's, again, I mean, I, 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 I'm very lucky to do it, but I also, there are thousands of people who work on these missions. And so, you know, talking about the trajectories, it's, it's still part of the mission that as much as I kind of understand the physics of it i could not do that job right like it's so there's so many different things and aspects of it and i love i love that too yeah, i love how you use black magic as a phrase so thank you for that <laughs> never been said in any of our sessions um i want to wrap up with a question i i don't think i've ever asked you personally before which is you know we see these this footage of all the engineers all the people that are behind these projects you know absolutely euphoric when a mission lands how do you feel personally like what what is that possibly is there uh, you know, for us Earthlings that are totally bound here with no projects going to another planet, spend years of your life on something and have it be successful must feel, I don't know. Yeah, it was, uh, so one, I did not think I was going to cry. I mean, so it just, so for background, when we do the, that landing, we've actually practiced that landing a few times, um, more than a few times, hundreds of times, really. But 
but we have a couple of times in which we go through the dress rehearsal landing. And that's to put some stress, uh, it's, it, it's a couple of things, One of the, to make it as familiar as possible so that during the day of landing, when it's actually happening, you're as sort of comfortable as you feel like you really can be, right? You've gone through it, you know where to look for your data, you've set up all your displays to be where they need to be, you understand what you know what it's going to be like trying to look at data while I don't know a camera is you know guy is looking uh, at your over your shoulder, um, so it just kind of feels a little bit more rehearsed and comfortable. And we also do that uh, we inject errors. There's a team called the Gremlin team, and I got to be a Gremlin once, which is really fun. And you um, you inject errors for the team that's on console to fix. So uh, the errors can be spacecraft issues. You could say all, all of a sudden the temperature is going hot. Like what are you going to do? But they can also be human issues. And in this case, oftentimes they are human issues, right? Which you say, this critical person that you have always asked, you know, to, to provide, I don't know, the you know, report on how things are going, they are sick. They're homesick. They, you know, they had food poisoning. They're not able to be there. And how are you going to cope with that situation? And so you can kind of create these different stresses on the system, understand how we would cope with those things. And again, if that happens during the day of landing or whatever, you're that much more prepared to deal with you. You know the process you're going to do to call that person's backup or um, do whatever else. So I thought, you know, having gone through those, I was like, I'm going to be a cool cucumber during the landing. You know, I'm excited, obviously, like it's a big moment. Um, but I was like, nah, all right, whatever. And, you know, as soon as it got close, like I was excited, of course, during each of the milestones, because there's so many things like that parachute, we only have one of if it doesn't work, that's it. So you're, you're, you know, this kind of tension is building as each thing kind of goes right. Uh, and I, you know, sure enough, as soon as I heard the, the, the Tango Delta nominal, which uh, the Tango Delta is being short for, for a touchdown, um, I started like, it just it started, you know, water started coming out of my eyes. Uh, and I think there's a, I mean, there's, oh gosh, there's so much that goes into that. But obviously at that point I had worked about nine years on the mission. Um, you know, I was so invested in that. It's, it was such a, like a, a payoff on really years of hard work and learning. And, and it also being my first mission, I think, and everything else. Um, that was an incredibly emotional thing. And to share it at some level with all these people that I, you know, that had become friends and that, you know, we worked so closely with together, uh, that it just, it's sort of the kind of experience, I hope everybody gets to have it. I don't have kids, but it feels like the closest thing that I can imagine to communally giving birth to a, you know, a baby Rover um, was that experience where, you know, a room uh, of, of about 50 people plus, you know, the thousands of people who had all been there who were watching in their different ways. Um, I think that was that, that was the closest that we could do to sort of, you know, feeling like, oh, we, our child is off into the world and uh, we're proud parents. And I think that was the kind of that, that set of emotion. So I, um, I hope everybody gets that in life, honestly. Like I, it's, it's still one of my fondest memories and experiences in life. And I hope that everybody gets to feel like they've built something and got to see it uh, be successful. It's, it's awesome. Well, I, I couldn't wrap up better than that if we possibly tried. So thank you so much for that, that personal story. And, and we really appreciate it. And uh, Bob Back, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks. All right. We look forward to having you back. Hopefully we get classes in soon. It'd be so nice to have a, a full slate of kids. Here. I miss the kids' faces. Yeah. Yes, I know. You just have to look at me and it's very unfortunate. Yeah. I apologize. Uh, that's good. I like that too. Uh, but <laughs> thank you. But yes, we'll have you back soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day for everyone tuning in at home. Again, 100 plus sessions in April alone featuring amazing scientists, educators, explorers, and facilities. So do keep tuning in live, free, no registration. We look forward to seeing you soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye for now, everyone.